morning, everybody. Preparing for a service here is fun because I get to work with Barbara Miller. And I think uh, I owe her an apology because she called me up yesterday. You're still coming tomorrow, aren't you? And I said, tomorrow? <laughs> and then I got an email from her. She said, I'm changing a lot of stuff in the, in the service. And I said, oh, okay, let's hope the sermon fits in. I think it does. Yeah, up a little bit. Should I start all over? No. If I can, I'll just say a few words about the situation in Charleston, South Carolina. Dylan Roof is a victim too. He is a victim of a culture that advocates violence as a solution to settling problems. He is a victim of a culture that worships what I consider to be the worst kind of religion, the religion that breeds separateness and hatred. He's the victim of a school system that failed him. He doesn't know how to think critically. People don't believe me when I tell them this, but one of the great accomplishments of the past governor of the wonderful state of Texas, who is now running for president, is getting a law passed that prohibits the teaching of critical thinking in the public school systems. Bet you didn't know that. Yeah, not a joke. Not, not a joke. It's against the law. What could Dylan have been besides a mass murderer? I don't know what his intellectual capabilities are. He could have been more than this. So the violence continues and more hearts are broken. I was very impressed that members of the families were able to address him at his pretrial hearing and I was very impressed that so many of them said that they could forgive him. What I would like to have heard is someone say, you are my son, you are my brother, you are a child of the universe, and when you need to talk, call me and I will come and visit you in jail. That might be a lot to ask, but I think that's where we need to get. So, for those of us who pray, let's hope that our prayers are heard and there will be some end to this violence. Uh, for those of us who can't pray, let's devote all our energy to stopping the insanity of bad education, separation through religious preaching, and the belief that violence settles everything. For my sermon, I've got a few quotes I'd like to read. This is from a gentleman named Seth Godin, who wrote Tribes, We Need You to Lead Us. A tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, and connected to an idea. For millions of years, human beings have been part of one tribe or another. A group needs only two things to be a tribe, a shared interest and a way to communicate. And this is from the writer Oliver Sacks. To live on a day-to-day -day basis is insufficient for human beings. We need to transcend, transport, escape. We need meaning, understanding, and explanation. We need to see overall patterns in our lives. We need to hope the sense of the future and we need freedom, or at least the illusion of freedom, to get beyond ourselves, whether with telescopes and microscopes and our ever burgeoning technology, or in states of mind that allow us to travel to other worlds, to rise above our immediate surroundings. And here's also in the theme of my sermon, here's a real interesting quote from Marlon Brando. Most of the successful people in Hollywood are failures as human beings. And some of you may have heard of an Austrian writer. I don't know his work very well, Stefan Zweig, Z-W-E-I-G. 
And he wrote a book in uh, 1922 called The Burning Secret. And this is from that book. A first premonition of the rich variety of life had come to him. For the first time, he thought he had understood the nature of human beings. They needed each other even when they appeared hostile. And it was very sweet to be loved by them. Eric Fromm wrote, a human being starts realizing that he is a complete creative person and that the only meaning of life is the life itself. Abraham Lincoln wrote, am I not destroying my enemies when I make friends of them? And he also wrote, to ease another's heartache is to forget one's own. And then finally, the remarkable wisdom of Dave Barry. The one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. <laughs> I do, you know, despite my insurance premiums. Right? A woman needs a man who appreciates her as an individual entity, not as someone who is an extension of himself. A woman needs a man who knows and believes that beauty is only, truly, only skin deep. That a woman's lasting beauty is in her deepest soul, her heart, her ability to nurture and comfort others, to be a productive individual, a part of the family, and a part of the community. A woman needs a man who is able and willing to share the day-to-day -day workload of life from meeting the most demanding challenges that a long-term relationship can ask of us to the simple daily chores of washing the dishes or taking out the trash. A woman needs a man who dresses well and looks nice when they are out in public together as a way of affirming his respect for her and his pride in being with her. And a woman needs to be sure that these four men never find out about each other. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Would I have gotten as good a laugh if I told it the other way around? No. Well, now that we know what women need and want, let's consider what we all need from our relationships with other people and the groups we're a member of during our lives. What do we have to offer our friends and our families and our communities? And how do we benefit ourselves when we share lives and our knowledge and our experience with each other? Abraham Maslow, a very highly regarded humanist psychologist, in 1943 wrote a paper called The Theory of Human Motivation. And he proposed the famous pyramid of human needs uh, built on the presumption that our more basic needs must be met before we begin to worry about or try to fulfill our more sophisticated needs. It's going to be impossible for most of you to see, but here's the pyramid right there. And down at the bottom, we've got physiological and then safety needs, love and belonging, esteem, and what he referred to as self-actualization. And uh, another phrase that is used in that regard is self-transcendence. I love that phrase. I, I do think that uh, his phrase, hold on just a minute, belongingness. Boy, talk about a bastardization of the English language. I know what he means, but he should have done better than that. Well, he studied what he called exemplary people. Uh, such as Albert Einstein, Jane Addams, the, the great sociologist and women's rights advocate uh, of the early 20th century, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Frederick Douglass, rather than the mentally ill or neurotic people. And he wrote, the study of crippled, stunted, immature, and unhealthy specimens can only yield a crippled psychology and a crippled philosophy. And he studied the healthiest 1% of the college population that he worked with. Now, while the hierarchy remains a very popular framework in sociology research, management, training, secondary, and other higher psychology instruction, it has been largely supplanted in the academic circles with what's called the attachment theory in graduate and clinical psychology and psychiatry. Now, if you're a student of human psychology, or psychiatry, and if you're familiar with the attachment theory, you're gonna be a little chagrined by my simplified definition of that theory, but here goes. 
You can't be happy. You can't be normal. You can't have a fulfilling childhood or adulthood if you have not been loved. The results of many years of research by students of individual of psychology and social psychology have proven the devastating impact that being unloved, that feeling alone in the world at a young age can have on the future of any individual. It can be said that even if we don't need love to survive, we certainly do need love to thrive. If we're to be able to be productive human beings, if we are going to be able to be empathetic, if we're going to be able to visit a church and not bring a gun with us, if we're going to be able to accept love and give love, if we're going to be fully matured and emotionally healthy people, we must be loved. Love is our anchor in the sometimes stormy sea of uncertainty into which we are born. It is the foundation upon which we build in our effort to become fully functioning adults. Love, looking at Maslow's pyramid, we're told that these first two levels of needs, physiological and safety needs, must be met before love has any importance or value to us. Attachment theory tells us from the day we breathe our first breath outside of the womb, all other things are secondary that we need to feel loved immediately. And that's why one of the, the great beliefs of most, most doctors and psychologists is the best thing a mother can do the moment the child is born is bring the baby to her breast and feed it. And the kids go for that in a big way. It's an immediate response. We know not only from the world of scientific research, but from evidence of our eyes and ears as we observe people who share our community and the world with us, that many of us do not receive the love we need when we're infants and children, and we know, some of us by personal experience, that the wounds we have had inflicted upon us in our early years when we're deprived of a loving, emotionally nourishing environment, these wounds might never really completely heal or disappear. For the rest of our lives, many of us are left seeking the love we do not receive and believing that we will never know love or experience it in our lifetimes. But those of us who believe we will never know love or never be loved are wrong. We can find love. We can heal our wounds. We can find friendship. We can find a new sense of family. We can find hope, and we can learn how to give love in return. And we can find all those things right here, right here in this church, right here with these people. If you are a visitor, we love one another and we will love you. We will embrace you in all of the pain you carry with you. We will always welcome you and we will always tell you that we need your love as much as you need ours. We will accept you with all of your gifts and all of your imperfections, and we will celebrate your life. And I believe that this is the greatest responsibility and the greatest opportunity that comes with being a member of a Unitarian Universalist congregation. To tell our friends, our community, and our world that this is a cathedral of love, of non-judgmental love, of all-embracing love, of healing love, of renewing love, of hope-giving love. Do you believe in God? Come in and worship with us. Do you doubt the existence of God? Come on in and worship with us. Are you a Christian? Come on in. Are you a Muslim? Come on in and worship with us. Are you a scholar? Come in and worship with us. Are you a bricklayer? Join us. Whoever you are, however you worship, whomever you love, we only ask one thing in return. Love us in return, for we need you every bit as much as you need us. And together, we can grow, we can learn to love again, we can heal, and we can help heal the world and bring hope and justice and love to every single breathing man, woman, and child on the face of this earth. 
Love is what we need, and it is what brings hope to all that we do. And love is what we find if we give of ourselves and accept all that we have to offer. Carl Jung, the great therapist, developed the concept of individuation. He believed that a human being is inwardly whole, but most of us have lost touch with important parts of ourselves. Through listening to the messages of our dreams and waking imagination, we can contact and reintegrate our broken apart selves. The goal of individuation, the process of coming to know and giving expression and harmonizing the various components of our psyche is a noble one. And I think the science of the human mind has done as much or perhaps more than simple belief in spirituality. We know how to heal and communities like this are amongst the most healing experiences in human life. If we realize our uniqueness, we can undertake a process of individuation and tap into our true selves. Each human being has a specific nature and calling which is uniquely his or her own. And unless these are fulfilled through a union of conscious and unconscious mind, we can become ill. Jung said that every person has a story and when derangement occurs, it's because the personal story has been denied or rejected. Some place along the line, Dylan Roof was denied his own sense of humanity and felt the agonizing pain of not being wanted. And despite all of the suffering that he has caused in this world, I think without understanding it, he suffers as much as the people, the families of the people that he murdered. I agree with Jung, and I believe he would agree with me when I assert that none of the healing processes of individuation is possible without the encouragement, the giving of courage that is brought to us with love. When we seek to heal ourselves, yeah, we're seeking to ameliorate our pain and our suffering, but I'm convinced that we have another motivation when we try to make sense of the painful parts of our lives. I believe we try to heal ourselves because we want to be able to reconnect with those around us. Not just ourselves, but the people around us. We want to be able to truly commune with the spirits of those with whom we live. In other words, we want to be able to love, we need to be able to love, the people with whom we spend our daily lives. In closing, remember these words of, of Herman Hesse. But every man is more than just himself. He also represents the unique. He, the very special and always significant and remarkable point at which the world's phenomenon intersect only once in this way and never again. And that can be said of each of us, only once in this way and never again. That is why every man's story is important, eternal, sacred. That is why every man, as long as he or she lives and fulfills the will of nature, is wondrous and worthy of every consideration. In each individual, the spirit has become flesh. In each man, the creation suffers. Within each one, a redeemer is nailed to a cross. So to this wisdom I add, love gives us hope, live, love gives us courage, love helps us heal ourselves, love brings healing to others, and in the end, love is all, and love is all we need.